Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's having a wonderful day. So before we get started, just a couple of things. Uh, the first thing I want to note is that uh, for my 811 students, uh, your interviews start on Wednesday. So just make sure you're at, at my office hour Zoom room when you uh, when at your scheduled time. Do not be late. So I'll be there and just remember, take a look at the instructions that I have on the course website about the interviews. So those will be starting up on Wednesday. So some students are gonna be meeting with me on Wednesday, but it'll be generally be, be until about Wednesday next week, I think. I think I'm meeting with people. But yeah, the final exam, uh, the final exam, I have a preliminary format out there. In the next couple of days, I will be filling in the last bits of the details there. Um, the exam is on the 17th, so that's a Friday. Just be aware of that. And it's for three hours. And uh, do take a look at the preliminary format that I have up. Like I said, I'll fill in the rest of the details in the next coming days. I also will be putting up a little mock quiz. It's not meant to be a practice quiz. It's just meant to just make sure that you proctor track is working properly for you. Because remember, for this exam, you have to be onboarded. Uh, so make sure if you have not done that yet, make sure you do the onboarding quiz on your courses, on our course website. You have to do it for each one of your classes. So if you have not done this, do the onboarding quiz. You have to do it at least eight hours. Well, at least that's what I recommended from somebody is at least eight hours it has to be done before you actually do the exam. If you already have done it, you can always check with the Proctor Track program to see if you're onboarded or not. If not, just do it anyways, just to be sure that it's all good to go. But you, we'll be doing the final exam over Proctor Track, so just remember that is a requirement for completing this exam. And it'll all be done online on that date. But anyways, that's all I really have to say other than that. I will be posting the solution to the final assignment pretty soon, so within the next day. If not, it might be even be later today. So that way you have that for studying purposes. Anyways. Are there any questions or concerns before we proceed? Because I got a lot of fun stuff to lay on you today. Okay, if we're good to go, I want to pick up from where I was last day. So last day I defined the notion of NP complete. So remember last day I told you that we call a problem NP complete or language NP complete if it's in NP and it's NP hard. So I also defined NP hard. That is where that means that if I give you any problem that's in NP, there's a polynomial time reduction that reduces to, to pi from each one of those. And at first it sounds really interesting in its own right, because it's just like, okay, well, how does that like how does that even work? <laughs> like, how do you have it where you can like cover the entirety of a computational complexity class like that? So I'll be addressing that in a moment. It's because I have to tell you about the existence of MP complete problems. Because I, I kind of just said that there's these problems that are the hardest of MP, but I didn't really clarify that these things actually exist. <laughs> so I got to talk a little bit about one of these and it's going to serve as the backbone to get up to things that may be affecting, say, if you're interested in some problem, whether you want to know if it's MP complete or MP hard, for example. So the first one that was ever discovered uh, in the literature, this is from the early 70s, uh, was the so-called satisfiability problem. Some people call this Boolean satisfiability. Um, it's abbreviated by SAT, S-A-T. And what does it involve? It actually involves Boolean expressions or Boolean formulas. So imagine you have it where you have to assign Boolean variables a value of true or false. So true meaning one, false meaning zero. And imagine I give you a Boolean formula uh, phi or phi. So this is not empty set, this is phi. <laughs> and it may consist of Boolean variables binary operators, so logical ones like AND and OR, or V or wedge and V, that's what, that's AND, that's OR, or unary operators like NOT. I'm using the sideways L, uh, but you're welcome to use a bar, meaning you write it above, you write above the symbol, like for example, if I give you, 
like a variable, like I called it x. If I write a bar above it, this is the same way of me saying not x. Some people use that as a shorthand. Either one's acceptable. There's a lot of different ways to write this, as long as it's very clear. And then lastly, I can group the operators and operands with parentheses. And typically the order of operations when it comes to these logical operators is not, and, and then or. So I wanted to do an example just to show you what one of these formulas may look like. So here's one, uh, so suppose phi is not x and y altogether, or x and not z, where x, y, and z are variables. And notice that I have my operators. Now, for those that have studied a bit of logic, um, you might look at this formula and say, okay, so what are we doing with this? So what I would like to do is figure out how I can assign x, y, and z. Is there a way I can assign x, y, and z so that the entire formula, so when I evaluate those truth assignments, when they're placed into this formula, it yields true, meaning its value is one when it's done evaluating over this entire formula. So the question that we're gonna be interested in is if such an assignment is possible. So can somebody tell me an example of an assignment that would work to evaluate this formula so that it is true? I, I, I think there may be multiple ones, but we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, zero, one, and this one, Z. What should we do with Z? I think, uh, yeah, I think it can. Let me just make, I'll make it zero. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Yeah, because I think, I think you're right. I think you're right. It doesn't really matter. So let's see here. So if I put in zero here, so it says not zero, so it means it's one, aka not false is true. So then I have true. Then it says, okay, one, so it means true and true. That evaluates the true because it's logical and. So we know in this case, this part will evaluate to one. And then here I have X, well, X is zero. And not Z, well, okay, that's just one. Well, this, this is okay to be zero and it's one or zero or true or false. So the, naturally this whole thing evaluates to being True, right? Very good, very good, wonderful. So now I wanna ask you a more fundamental question. So now we've seen that there exists an assignment for this. So what we would call phi here, we would say that phi is, is satisfiable. That means that there exists an assignment of its Boolean variable such that the whole Boolean formula evaluates true. So what I want to do with SAT is ask a very simple but fundamental question. Is if I want, if I'm given some, uh, some Boolean formula, does there exist an assignment of the truth values? So can I assign each one of those Boolean variables true or false, such that the whole formula is satisfiable, as in there exists some assignment, so it yields true. So I want to know if either there exists an assignment or no, there does not. And that's what SAT is. Now you might ask, Dan, why would this problem be very interesting? Well, think about it like this. Imagine, because for those that have learned some logic, you may know there's a natural correspondence between Boolean algebras and logical circuits, for example. So you can imagine somebody could give you some circuit, they can describe it to you as a Boolean formula, and then they can ask you, okay, given my circuit, that now it's a Boolean expression or Boolean value, or sorry, Boolean formula. I gotta keep my terminology consistent here. My Boolean formula for that circuit, 
I want to know if there exists some assignment of those truth values, which will naturally correspond to, for example, gates or inputs. In our case, there'll be inputs for the circuit. So I would like to know if there exists some toggling of those inputs so that when I get my, I look at all of my circuit, when I evaluate all of it and I get output, there's at least one way those inputs can be toggled so that I get a truth value. So naturally there's many ways you can cast this problem, whether it be a circuit based problem or as the name suggests, a satisfiability problem. As in like I give you a whole bunch of constraints that are written out as a logical formula. And naturally you'd like to know whether, it, whether there exists some way I can assign them. So this is a very natural problem, but it's also rather broad. Does everybody notice that? It's like, okay, I didn't tell you anything about the constraints on the problem. I just said it's just some, there's some Boolean, Boolean formula, right? Like there's obviously a cap on that when it comes to encoding it, right? But that's a rather general problem. You're going to see very quickly as we proceed in this lecture that sure, it's very nice to know that, but it would be nice to also have problems that have maybe a little bit more of a narrower formulation, but also maybe have similar properties to this. So first, does everybody understand what I mean by SAT just before I proceed? Because I just want to make sure you understand what SAT is. Okay. I think we're okay. I think we're okay. Give me two thumbs up if we're okay. If we're doing okay, everybody understands what we mean by SAT? Okay. So in the 1970s, uh, one of the names of this theorem, uh, Stephen Cook, uh, laid out, for example, the, a proof for SAT being NP complete. Uh, so it's named after at Cook and Levin. Uh, Levin independently had derived the same result. And all it really is, is just saying that SAT is MP complete. So you know that actually these MP complete problems actually exist. And remember, I told you some strange stuff about these MP complete problems if they exist. So just as an example, uh, actually I should mention, if you want to get the proofs for both of these, you can find in each respective in Hopcroft book and the Sipser book, you can find uh, the proofs there. I don't have enough time to go into the details of those. They're rather intricate proofs. Um, but I feel like for the purposes of our lecture, we won't benefit as much if I were to go into this in detail. But it's a rather interesting theorem if you're really curious about it. Here's an interesting corollary of this based on what I said last day. So. So because SAT is NP complete, what does that mean? Well, SAT is in P if and only if P is equal to NP. So it means that if you can find me a polynomial time algorithm, is a proof long? Ah, depends on which version you would like. Um, I would, it has some setup to it. Uh, I would say that it, Compared to some of the other proofs we've seen, it is longer. Uh, but I would say that you have most of the machinery to understand it, though. It just takes a lot. Of, it's, it has a lot of setup to it. But it is something that if I had, say, another, few, another week, I would cover it for you. But uh, it, it's one of those things, right? It's just there's a lot of setup. That's a wonderful question, though. If you find yourself curious about it, go check it out. It's, it's, it is really interesting. Because obviously because of the fact that there's this NP hard part, it has to take any formulation form an NP problem, right? It has to be some way I could take any arbitrary one of those and translate it into in polynomial time, right? Because it has to be polynomially reducible to, it, to SAT, right? It, it's so, that being said, once you know what we said last day about NP complete problems, if any one of them is in P, then P is equal to NP. But I already told you that one of these actually exists. So this is an immediate corollary if you could establish that SAT's in P. But I must stress, because SAT is NP complete, you already know SAT is in NP. But we don't know this. 
So I just want to make sure it's clear, like, we don't know this as a matter of fact. So if you want to be a little bit more precise about this, <laughs> if, if sat is in P, if it only if, but either way. Anyways, this brings me to really one big point of this lecture. Is that problems that are either, problems that are either NP hard or NP complete seem intractable. Intractable. Since no polynomial time algorithms are known, and I must stress known, it's not that they don't exist, it's just that we don't know if they exist or not, are known uh, to solve uh, these kind of problems. So for example, for SAT, what you can do is you could just try every combination of the Boolean variables and assign them. So give every single one an assignment and you can do this in exponential time, right? Because there's, if I give you n variables, there's big O of two to the power of n evaluations that could exist, right? So that's a trivial exponential time algorithm for this. Uh, SAT, for example, is a very interesting problem in its own right, because in practice, there's actually do exist solvers for SAT, and they actually, for many instances, including some practical ones, there do exist pretty effective solvers, but they don't, they don't guarantee proofs of saying that, yeah, they guarantee that for SAT itself, which is a much more broader problem, that, that it runs in polynomial time. That's a much, more, much bolder claim. So I already see the difference between the two. This is why, for example, when you see something in, in, in empirically that works pretty well, that's not a good enough merit of proof to say that, yeah, this is actually going to run in a certain time. That requires a proof. It's a much stronger claim. So when you're working out different rungs of evidence, you have to keep that in mind. It's a very common thing that happens <laughs> that I just want you to be aware of. So that brings me to talking about that there exists another definition for NP complete based on what I just I was suggesting the previous lecture. So here's a second definition. This is the one that most of you will find very useful. So if pi is NP complete and pi prime is in NP and there exists a polynomial time reduction from pi to pi prime, then pi prime is also NP complete. So there's another definition. Let me just reiterate what I've written here. If pi is NP complete and pi prime is in NP, and there is a polynomial time reduction, pi two pi prime, then pi prime is also NP complete. Does anybody have any ideas of why this would be true? Any suggestions? Yes, yes, exactly. So that's exactly it. That's exactly it. It's because of this polynomial time reduction. So remember our properties of reductions. If I already know that pi is NP complete and I have just, I'm just adding a polynomial 
amount of more time with respect to the original instance, which in this case would be based on Pi, then Pi Prime just gets to hang on and grab all that baggage from Pi. So Pi Prime is also MP complete. Another way you can kind of check this over is if you imagine, just hypothetically speaking, that if you had Pi Prime, and imagine if you established that Pi Prime is in P, then what you could do is you could say, okay, well, given any, uh, so if I were to tell you that Pi Prime is say, yeah, say is in P, then, then I can tell you, okay, I could give you any one of the uh, other problems that I have here. I can use the polynomial time reductions to get me over there. And then I could run the polynomial time algorithm for pi prime. Do you see how this becomes essentially a game of reductions? So is that neat? So, so we don't, we actually have all the machinery to show problems are empty complete and discover new ones. So we don't have to do this very sophisticated idea where we have to really just take every problem in NP. We can carry that along. And in fact, that's very often what we do is we start off, we start off with something like SAT. So based on Cook's or Cook-Levin theorem or Cook's theorem, however you'd like to say it, you start off with this and then you just use this definition to get you in, and create more NP complete problems. So as long as there exists a polynomial time reduction from an NP complete problem, to yours, and you can guarantee your problems in NP, then it also has to be NP complete. I have a question for you. If pi prime in my definition over here, if that isn't in NP, what can you say about pi prime? Yeah, so, so if I give you pi, so if I have pi and pi prime like I have here, and I get rid of the restriction that I require that pi prime is in NP. What would that mean? So what would it mean for pi prime? Yes, yes, yes. So it's just NP hard. So remember, NP complete means NP hard and it's also in, in NP. So if I don't have that NP part, it means it's NP hard. Now, I must stress, based on this definition, you can very naturally prove problems are actually NP hard, and that includes optimization problems. So if you ever wonder when you're reading up a paper, whether you're a grad student or you're just interested in learning about things, and you ask, okay, so somebody tells you like the traveling salesman problem, which is an optimization problem, classically speaking, um, and they tell you, oh, it's NP hard. You might ask, okay, well, we've been talking about decision problems all this time, and I briefly, I briefly touched upon this when I talked about the connection between optimization problems and decision problems. Um, but oftentimes people say, okay, this problem's NP hard, so how do I do that? How do I establish that? All you do is you just use this definition I have right here, just drop the part where I require that pi prime is an NP. And that's, that's how actually how you can prove a problem's, an, problem's NP hard. Does everybody see that? And that's very often how people prove problems are empty hard, usually. So if you find yourself reading a paper and they say, oh, we're, we're gonna prove it's empty hard, usually this is how it's done. They show you a polynomial time reduction from an empty complete problem. Yes. Ah, well, you will encounter problems that are not NP complete um, and most certainly will be at least NP hard. So remember, NP hard is sort of just this, the thing about NP hard is it's kind of interesting because you can look at it like this. So let me draw you a picture. So if you assume that P is not equal to NP, then it will be like this. So you have P and P like this. And along here, like if you were to measure this based on difficulty, the MP complete ones, hypothetically speaking, I would just I'm just trying to visualize them being like right here, right on the rim of this. Although technically, if you like I said, by Cook's theorem and these all these reductions, you really just are interested in these if you really care about the class NP. Um, so there's these other problems that are out here too. So like I mentioned the other day, there's also X. So all of these from and at least as hard standpoint, 
they usually will fall into NP hard. However, and, and this is one thing I should also worth, it's worth mentioning, that you can also describe things like the halting problem in terms of these things. So for example, halting problem can be viewed as an NP hard problem, which is very, very strange to think about, but it's only because NP hard just simply means, okay, it's at least as hard as every problem in NP, right? So all I have to do is just give you some reduction to some problem, and then I can show you how you would solve it uh, in polynomial. Sorry, no, I don't even need to do that. I just need the polynomial time reduction, right? So if there's just some way I can reduce from that problem to my problem at hand, that's all I need, but I need to do it for all problems in NP, but all I need is really just one. Like, you can see how conceivably you could build a Turing machine and, and give it and describe it in terms of a Boolean formula, for example. These would be generally how you could go about these things uh, for something like the halting problem. Uh, but like I said, it's, 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 it, it gets a little bit away from the point because obviously a halting problem is undecidable, right? You would not describe it like that. You would describe it as, okay, a halting problem is undecidable. That's technically a more accurate way of describing it, but from a technical standpoint, it's also NP hard. <laughs> it's kind of weird like that, right? <laughs> But yeah, you will encounter problems that aren't necessarily MP complete for a couple of reasons. One, they may not be decision problems. So if you have an optimization problem that only, that, where you're trying to compute the optimum, it may be an MP hard problem. Um, but it most certainly, uh, you try to find the most accurate bucket to throw it in. So if it's a problem that involves this exponential search over several things and its output is not polynomial in its size, you're most likely gonna be looking at something like exp. Um, but hopefully that clarifies that a little bit. You're gonna find very often, you're, you're gonna try to find the most appropriate bucket to throw it in. <laughs> and sometimes there is plenty of overlap. Wonderful, wonderful. So I wanna talk a little bit about problems where I can take now my, my trusty sat and now I can kind of go around saying, okay, now other problems are MP complete. So now this is where things are going to get a little bit interesting because now I'm going to just, I'm just going to go a little wild, just to be honest. I'm just going to start throwing problems at you and just telling you that, oh yeah, there exists a polynomial time reduction to it. I'm just trying to encourage and motivate you that you're going to probably run into problems like these. But you have to be very careful because it's always about the problem formulation. So for example, if you're looking at an industrial problem, it may fit the mold of one of these kind of problems, but it may actually be a very much a very restricted case of it, meaning that it may not necessarily be truly MP hard or MP complete. So just always be careful of that in practice. Uh, that's why there's other kinds of algorithmic theories that usually try to address these kind of things. We haven't really had a chance to talk about those kind of things in this course, but if you find yourself curious about this kind of stuff, just let me know and I'm happy to give you some references. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about this. So I must stress that there's at least hundreds upon hundreds of MP complete problems. And I must stress also that I'm pretty confident that there's like there, there are like infinitely many of these because every single one I could just take a small wrinkle and just tweak it ever so slightly. Um, but I'm when I say this, what I'm trying to tell you is that if you were to go into the research literature and you go digging around and saying, okay, I'm gonna go find me some MP-complete problems, at almost every algorithms conference, you're probably gonna find somebody trying to prove another problem's MP-complete. And if you want to just a simple, I, I won't use the word heuristic, but it's most certainly a simple way of measuring this, is if you have a conference and each paper generally tries to establish the MP-completeness or MP-hardness of a given problem, um, maybe every other one. And say there's like 30 papers there. There's 15 there. Then if there's say at least 40 different conferences that happen in a year, then multiply it by that number. And then multiply this by since at least the mid 70s or early 80s. You get my idea. There's a, there's a lot of these kind of hundreds upon hundreds of MP complete have been discovered. And they're all over the place. 
Like, I, I don't want to tell you, like, oh, yeah, you're only going to find them when you're looking at these kind of problems. You're going to, when you're going and looking in different domains, whether you're interested in, like, theoretical computer science or you're doing something very applied, like you're doing stuff in AI or you're doing stuff in, say, image processing or you're interested in, in imaging, uh, there's sometimes you're going to run into these things. They may exist, so I'm just warning you that they, the, that these problems just creep up. They're just sort of a, an, a facet of running into problems sometimes. And this algorithmic theory of intractability would be very helpful to communicate some of these things. So just to give you a flavor, I'm just going to kind of skip ahead. I'll come right back to this. I just want to give you just some examples of just, just kind of problems you could run into. So just as an example, uh, you may have heard of graph coloring problems. Uh, so you may know of graph coloring or three coloring or four coloring. There's a lot of these kind of problems that exist. They often have applications in, in conflicts, conflict resolution. So for example, if you're interested in having systems where there's no conflicts among agents within that system, very often coloring problems tend to creep up. Um, also, naturally, a lot of scheduling problems also fall into this camp. Uh, covering problems, we're going to talk about one of those in a, in a little bit. Uh, covering problems, I'm going to talk about later on about vertex cover. So I'll define what vertex cover is in a moment. And there's also another one called set cover. Very often these types of problems will have it where you have some set of objects and you have to pick from some set of members of those objects so that you try to attempt to cover over the entirety of the collection. So in this case, if you give you a graph, your job is maybe to pick a subset of the vertices um, such that every one of the edges that is incident on that vertex is covered. Here's a, another example, a uh, packing problem. So now I'm not saying that every covering problem you're gonna run into or every coloring problem you're gonna run into is NP complete. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that there's lots of different domains you're gonna run into these things, these NP complete problems. For example, uh, you may have heard of zero on knapsack. Uh, this is where I give you a collection of items, each with a weight and a profit. You can imagine me kind of sneaking in like a burglar, trying with my knapsack, coming to go look for items to put into my knapsack. And the goal is to maximize the profit in my knapsack such that I don't overfill it. So a lot of these types of packing problems, another one, I didn't put it in my list here, but another one is, for example, bin packing. This is where you have a bunch of items that you need to place into bins and your goal is to minimize the number of bins you use to fit them in. You can think of this like moving. If you have a moving truck and you have a bunch of items that you need to fit into the truck. Uh, so, so just as an example, like say, say if you run out of space in one truck, you would like to pack it so it's optimally packed so you don't need to make as many trips with your moving vehicle as possible. You can see how many of these types of problems have a lot of applications in industry. Um, the kind of problems that I tend to be very fascinated by are usually graph theoretic versions of these uh, scheduling problems. A classic one is the multiprocessor scheduling problem. So if you ever find yourself curious about, okay, well, how are all of these MP complete or MP hard? Um, all of these have decision versions of them. Every single one of them in these decision forms is NP complete. Um, so for example, this multiprocessor scheduling, the way it works is that every, you, you're given a set of machines and you're given a set of jobs and your job, pun intended, is to assign each job to a machine so that when you look at all of your machines, which all of them operate in parallel, hence its name, all of these machines operate in parallel and the objective is to minimize the total length of the schedule. And this is what we call the make span. So those that may be interested in optimization, you might know this as make span minimization or load balancing, depending on which setting you're looking at. So 
These are some examples of things that you may run into, and all of them have decision versions that all are MP complete. There's many other kinds of problems like these. These are just, this is just a very small short list of them. So I want to kind of just jump back and talk a little bit about some problems. So the first thing I want to talk about is a problem called 3SAT. So it's called 3Satisfiability. Suppose we consider Boolean formulas. Formulas or formulae of a special form. And this, this form is going to be called conjunctive normal form. Which usually is abbreviated as CNF. The one thing I will warn you about is do not conflate this with Chomsky normal form. It has the same acronym, but it's not the same thing. <laughs> so just always be careful when you're reading some arbitrary paper and they're talking about Chomsky, for example. They're probably not talking about this unless they're very clear. Okay, I'm just going to define some terms here. A literal, a literal is a Boolean variable, is a Boolean variable that is the variable. So for example, if I tell you it's X, it's X. Or, or it negated. So what I mean by that is if I give you a variable x, it's x, or it's not x. So it's either x or not x. That's what I mean by a literal. So a clause... A clause consists of literals connected with or, with ors, where clauses are connected Connected with ands. So when you have these, these look a lot more specific, right? They're not just simply just like any old Boolean formula. They, they have a very specific form to them. So when we talk about 3SAT, when we talk about 3SAT, we're going to be talking about something a little, uh, a little bit more specific. And that's a good thing, believe it or not. Sorry, I'm just, just collecting my thoughts here. Okay. So you might ask, okay, so what is 3SAT? So... So here's, uh, here's what 3SAT is. So, so 3SAT is given, given any conjunctive normal form formula, a phi, where every clause consists of three literals is phi satisfiable. So that's what 3SAT is. And here's the neat part.
there is a polynomial time reduction from sat to three sat. So you might notice that this has a lot more structure to it. So a lot of times when you have something like three sat, often what researchers will do, and three sat is a very helpful one to jump to, because like I said, it has a lot more structure to it. Now you have variables where the number of literals is some fixed number. So oftentimes what they'll do, they try to encode these into what we call gadgets. And often for graph theoretic problems, we try to build these so-called gadgets to, to effectively represent truth, truth or false assignments, depending on what the constraints of the problem are. I won't have time to really show you what one of these would look like, but if you find yourself curious, uh, most, I think I have some cross references in the notes if you're curious about it. So I want to elaborate on a couple of things. Now we may not get to the application of the reduction that I would like to talk about, but I'll leave it in the notes for you to take a look at. It, I think it is something that is interesting in its own right. I won't examine you on it, but it most certainly is something interesting because I'm just looking at the time and I want to make sure we get to at least what we need to talk about here today. So you might ask, okay, well, what can we do once we have three sat? Well, the other day I showed you about clique, right? And I showed, told you that clique's an NP, right? Well, well, what you could do is now you can take three sat and there does actually exist a polynomial time reduction. So that three sat polynomially reduces to clique. So clique is MP complete. So we know clique is MP complete, right? It just comes right out of this. It also can be shown a three sat polynomially reduces to what I'm going to abbreviate as DHC, which is going to, I'm going to refer to as the is Hamiltonian cycle with a directed graph. So this is just simply where I have edges where they have directed edges. So you could actually perform a polynomial time reduction to this, implying that DHC is MP complete. Then what you could do is you could also produce a polynomial time reduction to Hamiltonian cycle, which it would of course imply that Hamiltonian cycle, this is MP complete, right? That's the consequence of all of this. However, do you remember what I did the other day? What was the problem I used for my reduction uh, where I used it from Hamiltonian cycle? And I showed you also that it was an NP. Which one was it? It was the, it starts with a T. Think of me walking around a graph. T yeah, the decision version of TSP. Exactly. I think I have this on all caps in my notes. So, so from that, you could just get right away that so this is the power of those polynomial time reductions, is that all you have to establish is that your problem is an NP and there exists a polynomial time reduction like this. That's all you have to do. Is that, that's a really powerful mathematical mechanism if you think about it. Um, as a technical note, based on what I said previously, we could say that the, with TSP, if I'm talking about the optimization problem, we would say that the problem is NP hard, just to be clear. So don't be coming out of my class after and be like, Dan told us that TSP is NP complete. No, say it's NP hard. <laughs> That's, remember, TSP is a, an optimization problem. It, uh, it's not a decision problem, but its decision counterpart is NP complete. In fact, a lot of people, when they tell you what an, an optimization problem is NP hard, 
a very simple way of proving it is just, just consider its decision version and ask if that's MP complete. Then there's a trivial reduction from, from your TSP decision to the one for the optimization version based on what I described that other lecture ago where I showed you how you can compute the optimal answer, right? It's so it's so obvious to some people that that's literally they you just say it as a theorem and that's it. <laughs> so so just uh, just to be clear, there's many of these kind of reductions. And in fact, there's other combinations of these reductions. So can you see it very much like I've just just given you this ability now to talk about one problem in terms of another problem, but also I've inherited the intractable properties of something like SAT for other problems. And by doing this every single time, I carry around this polynomial time baggage that translates that problem to the other problem. So I'm not saying that every single one of them is the exact same. I'm saying that there's actually a polynomial time reduction that gets me over there. So the whole game in town now is that I can translate one problem to another problem using some polynomial time. And if I have a whole chain of these, you can see how we can use the properties of reductions to tell us things about their MP completeness. Does everybody get the general idea of the, why we use polynomial time reductions now? So like this is like the big mechanism and there's many different reductions that exist between different problems. You could, like I said, you can think of it like a zoologist going around categorizing problems based on their difficulty. Or if, if you want my more fun way of describing it, it's like being a Pokemon master, you see? You gotta get them all. And, and the thing is, we never really run out of them. <laughs> that seems to be the case because we always create more problems. It's like every generation of a Pokemon game. <laughs> it, just, it just doesn't end. <laughs> um, so I wanna talk about another problem. This is what I'm going to finish up things on just because of time, but I'm going to encourage you to take a look at what I have in the notes. If you want to stick around after, I can always give you the idea after I finish up the lecture here. If you're curious about it. So I'm going to prove something. I'm going to prove MP, com uh, sorry, vertex cover is MP complete. I'm going to abbreviate vertex cover as VC. And I got to define what VC is for you. So, so given an undirected graph, given an undirected graph, G is equal to VE, where V are the vertices, and E are its edges, are its edges, and an integer, and an integer. I'm going to make this integer be some value between the number of vertices and zero. A lot of these problems you can get away with doing this. Does G have a subset, have a subset C of vertices where every edge or every edge where every edge is incident, is incident, that says incident over there, uh, on some V in my cover C of size at most K. So we call this C, by the way, C is called a vertex cover. So I'm gonna do an example. I'm gonna give you a construction from clique, and then I'm going to give you the connection between the two, and I'll invite you to read its proof. So notice I haven't talked about really this problem up to this point, other than that brief remark over there. So you're just gonna be given a graph, you're gonna give it some integer. You're going to try to see if there's this vertex cover that exists. So let me do an example. It'll help really clarify what this means for anybody that's not as cozy with the graph terminology. It's wrapping things up here almost. We're almost, almost there. 
I don't want to keep you too much longer. Okay. So here's an example. Let's suppose I give you a graph that looks like this. Looks like a big W for winning, you see. It's for winning. <laughs> Zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, so here's, here is a graph. Looks kind of cute, like a fun mustache. So you might ask, okay, so what is a vertex cover? Now suppose, so remember it's a subset of the vertices. So suppose I picked, for example, just, just for our sake, this I'm gonna first present something to you. So for example, if I pick two and four, what this will do is it will cover, so if I pick these ones, I look at the edges for which they are incident on these. So for example, this edge is covered, this edge is covered, this edge is covered. Did I miss any edges? <laughs> yeah, I missed this one. So you'd say that this is what, you would say that 2, 4, the set 2, 4, 2, 4 is not a vertex cover. Can somebody tell me what a vertex cover would be here? I'll give you a hint. We're gonna need this one to get that one. <laughs> yeah, one and three, perfect, perfect. So you could say that if you include one and three, notice that this edge is incident on this vertex, this edge is incident on that vertex, this edge is incident on this vertex, and that final edge is incident on three. However, so you could say one, three is a vertex cover, and you would say that this is a yes instance. So let's walk through, remember what we have to do to establish that it's MP-complete. So since we've done this at least a few times, so the first part, well, we haven't done the whole part here, but let's walk through this quickly. So first we have to establish that vertex cover is an NP. Can somebody tell me a good certificate for me to use? I'll keep, yeah, 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 exactly. So you could you could just give me a vertex cover, which is just a subset of the vertices, right? So I'll just say use a certificate. See that that is a subset of the vertices, a vertex cover. So now I have to go through the process of checking this. So can somebody tell me what conditions I need to check for my polynomial time verifier? So there's two things I really have to check. So remember there's that K that we have to take into account, right? So what do we test first? Well, what can we test first? So what should we test? So first, remember there's two things that make a vertex cover of size at most K. There's the vertex cover part and it's its size, right? I think the first natural thing is to check its size. So check whether C consists of at most K vertices. Seems like a very natural thing to check. The other one, this is just good. I'll just write it down for the purposes of time because we really need to get on out of here. Test that whether or not for every, so I check every one of the edges, and I see that at least one of its two endpoints is in my vertex, sorry, in my subset of vertices, right? So I check one, if one of these is in C, then we're okay. So 
So all we do is uh, test whether or not for every U, V, and E, at least, at least one of U or V, at least one of U or V is in C. So naturally, once you have both of these tests, you just check if both tests pass. Pass, then we return yes. Or and our Turing machine speak would say it accepts. So we accept, otherwise reject. Which of course means proof is a bunch of nonsense. So using this, so I'm pretty sure you can convince yourself that this runs in polynomial time, right? I just have to check it against the graph. So notice that's a very important part of this. Okay, so that's the first part of the proof. There's the second part of the proof is exactly the polynomial time reduction in play. There's several different reductions that exist uh, to show that vertex cover is MP complete. One standard one is this one, where you establish that there's a polynomial time reduction from clique. In fact, there's actually an equivalency between these two. So for example, if you find yourself wanting to show that clique is MP complete, you can start off with vertex cover and show there's a polynomial time reduction to clique. Um, so there's actually a very interesting relationship these two have. So here's the idea. So imagine I have that graph over there. And remember one and three are the vertex cover. Here's an idea. So I'm gonna get all the details in my notes here. I'll recommend you take a peek at it, but here's the idea. It relies on me constructing the complement of a graph. So we build the complement of G. So if this is G, I'm going to build the complement of G. So I'll call it G bar. So it's gonna have the same vertices as my example over there. I think this is pretty nifty, this one here. 0, 2, 4, 1, and 3. And now what we're going to do is whenever there's an edge, so notice that I have an edge from 1 to 0 here. What I would, And also notice that 1, there's an edge from 1 to 2. What I do is I look at all of the vertices that for which there is no edge from 1 to that other endpoint. And I, all I do is I just simply include and connect those. So for example, there's no edge from 1 to 3, so I'm going to include that in this graph. Notice that there's also no edge from one to four. And there's no edge from three to zero. So I'm just gonna put one in there. And I think I need, yeah, it's from zero to two because there's no edge there and there's no edge from two to four. And then there's no edge from zero to four. So this, for example, is what we're gonna call G bar. Now there's a very interesting relationship that these two graphs actually have. So here's the theorem. So I'll, I would like you to take a look at the proof for this. But let me just get the theorem here for everybody. So now here's the main connection between these two. There is a clear, there is a K clique. There's a K clique in G, sorry, in G, yeah, in G, if and only if, if and only if there is a vertex cover, vertex cover C of size, k prime. Now I'm going to tell you what k prime is. So k prime is going to be equal to the set of vertices in that graph minus the ki sign over here. So in this case, if I tell you that k is equal to 2, you're going to take, in this case, there's five vertices. So I would take 5 minus 2, which is equal to 3. So what I'm asking, so what I'm saying with this theorem is that there's a 3 clique meaning a clique of size three. Does anybody see the clique over in that graph? The clique of size three. I intentionally drew it a little bit funny. 
You're used to it looking a little different if you think of the name of what it is in a graph. Got 0, 2, and 4. Notice that this forms a triangle if you actually look at it. So, so notice if you like this, this, and this, if you look at all of these vertices right here, notice that there's an edge that connects every one of those with each other. So there's always a pair of vertices for each one of the edges. Hence, you have a clique of size 3 here. So I want you to take a look at the proof for this just to convince yourself that there's this direct connection between the two. And because of this result, that means whenever I build that graph over there, if I get an answer yes, that means in the original one there's a yes, and likewise if there's a yes over here, there's a yes over there. If there's a no over here, that means there's a no over there. And that completes the proof. So, so that being said, I think that's everything I up here. I just want to make sure I didn't I don't miss anything that's too critical for us. But here's the big idea here. Notice that I've actually given you a whole bunch of MP complete problems this lecture. Many of them cover in all sorts of different facets of computation, ranging from scheduling all the way to covering problems like this one that have applications and all sorts of things from social networks all the way up to parallel computing. So I'm hoping that this will give you some tools. So if you're going out, whether you're interested in theory of computation or you're in practice and you're trying to learn a little bit more about your problem, do encourage and look at this type of theory. It could often be very insightful and help you directly connect problems to each other, whether it be being the MP completeness aspect of it or the polynomial time reduction, which in itself is a very powerful idea. So that's everything I actually have to say for everybody here. So, uh, first, I want to say thank you very much for your time. I really am apologizing for how long things have gone here because I really needed to finish this up with you. So hopefully that's okay with everybody. I'm really sorry about that. Um, I feel really bad. <laughs> but then, so, so that being said, I want to say thank you very much, everybody. It was really a great term. So just keep in mind your exam is not until the 17th, so you'll still have some plenty of time to play around with things. And also keep in mind, and I, 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 is that is that first, uh, actually, before anything, I want to say thank you for being in the class. It's always been great and always humbles me to have such bright students and especially fun students that, like, like everybody here that have made this term really wonderful. So I want to say thank you to everybody. And hopefully you came out of this course learning something new that you can use for your own daily life. Because a lot of this fundamental theory creeps into all sorts of things. So I want to say thank you to everybody. So that being said, I want to say thank you very much. All the best with the remainder of the term. And have yourself a beautiful day, everybody. Okay? So I'll see everybody later.